you're a good, good father. That's who you are. That's who you are. That's who you are. And I'm loved by you. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. I hope this morning you can say that. I hope you feel that. I hope it's in your bones. I hope it's who you are. What are you passionate about? What floats your boat? What excites you and gets you overjoyed? What makes you jump out of bed in the morning and gets you raring to tackle the world? Man, get out of bed and go, yes, I want to go to work. Yes, I want to go do this. Yes, I want to get up and go, 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 go. Passion. You know, that's not a word that's used very often. Passion is defined as intense emotional drive or excitement. Fill that in blank. Intense emotional drive or excitement. That's what passion is. So if we use that, I question you, I look at you and say, then what are you filled with passion over? What evokes an intense emotional drive or excitement in you? Do you have passion about your work? Yes, I'm going to get up this morning and go to work. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, I'll bet. Are you passionate about your friends? I'm going to go see my friend today. All right. Are you passionate about your car? I'm going to get in my car and drive today. I love my car. I'm passionate about my car. Do you have intentional emotional drive jump out of you when you think of your house or your family, your neighborhood, your favorite team, or your hobby? You know what? I challenge you this morning to answer the question, am I a passionate follower of Jesus Christ? The title of the sermon is simply, Be a Passionate Follower. And that question is straightforward and demands, yes, I said demands, demands an answer, a truthful answer from you. If you are a passionate follower, that means that you have an intense emotional drive about Jesus, that you think of him often, and that you are excited about your relationship with him. If you said no, then I want you to try to stay awake and listen to God's voice today. And at the end of the sermon, I'm going to ask the same question again. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open them up to Colossians. Now, I'm going to say something that I haven't said in a long time. I'm all about you using iPhones. Look, I want you to have a Bible of some sort. But I'm going to tell you that this year, I'm going to be more of an expositor than I have been in the past. And what that means is that when you have a Bible opened up, a book Bible, you can stay with the Scripture much easier than in this section. It's a long, large section that we're using today. And so if you're on an iPhone, you're going to hit the first bit, and then when, I, when we get down to 10 verses and I say something about verse 2, you're going to have to... It's harder... And you might say, okay, Pastor Mark, but it's harder to carry a Bible. Come on. Come on. Okay. Get your Bible cover like I, this. Thank you, Roman. <laughs> yeah. Use a Bible cover instead. My point is I want you to start thinking about bringing your Bible. The great thing is this. As our church continues to do what we're doing, looking at God's Word, taking it to the world, we're going to expand and be more people than ever every Sunday. We're on a growth spurt. We're in a growth move, and it's going to continue. Today, Colossians chapter 3, the section is going to be verses 1 through 17. That's a big chunk of Scripture, but we're going to break it into four parts, but I want you to be there, okay? Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is. Sit at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You know, when you look at 
that, you see, since you have been raised, since then you have been raised with Christ. Since you, capital U, you. Now, who are we talking to here? Who is Paul writing to? Paul's writing to the church of Colossae, and inside of that church, he's writing to the church. He's writing to believers. Since you, my brother and sister, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, this letter is written to you. Capital Y, capital O, capital U, underlined bold letters, you. This letter is written to you. Since you have been raised. Now, what did he mean by that? Once you ask Christ to be your personal Lord and Savior, you are connected with him. And guess what? Jesus Christ was born of a virgin and lived for 33 years, and they crucified him on the cross of Calvary. He died on the cross. He spent his blood on the cross of Calvary. At the end of his life, he died. They took him off the cross. They took him to a bar or two, and they rolled a stone over him. Three days later, he came out alive. Everybody say alive. alive. Now, me, say it like you mean it, alive. alive. He is alive. He has been raised from the dead. Forty days after that, after speaking to over 500 people at different times, he ascended to the right hand of God the Father. When you think about you have been raised with Christ, you have been raised out of the muck of your sin. You have been raised out of the dirtiness of the sin that the world has. Now, Pastor Mark, does that mean that we can never sin? Give me a break. We sin every day. I have really caught... That's not me. Ooh, time out. Okay. God and I have conquered road rage. Pretty, pretty good. I, I really, I'm, thank you. My wife said yes. I, that's good. So, you know, I mean, I had to work with that. I, you know, I had you all praying for me for two years. There's a bunch of stupid drivers out there. And they cannot drive as good as me. Okay? Get off the road. We have been taken from the sin and covered by the blood of Christ and raised with Him. When we sin today, which we do every day, by voice, thought, and deed, we ask for forgiveness. Amen. And God gives us forgiveness. Amen. But we are raised up. So be certain of the fact that you, be certain you have been raised with God. You. And then it says, set your heart. Man. Now I don't know about you, I, I like my heart. My heart's pretty important to me. It actually is a muscle that pumps. Have you ever listened? And we've got a bunch of medical people. If you listen at it through a uh, stethoscope, it sounds like what? A washing machine. That's what I've always heard. No? Yes? Yes? No? Yeah. Okay. I'm right. There's a bunch of bad drivers out there. I'm right. <laughs> washing machine. It sounds like a washing machine. But it's pumping blood. It is vital for us. If our heart stops, dude, we're done here on earth. We're, we're out of it. I had open heart surgery about six years ago, and they had six bypasses. Didn't even know my heart was in bad shape. Doesn't matter. It's not the story. Here's the great thing. Before I went into ministry, I was a sales rep for Kimberly Clark Corporation, a Fortune 100 company. I was in the OR almost every day because that's the stuff I was selling. And what, during my training, during those years I was with them, what amazed me, and I love, I didn't like going into all these surgeries. There's some ugly, nasty ones. Open heart surgery. First time I was in Phoenix, Arizona, and we training, and I went in the open heart. And we're just standing by the wall, but we can see. And when they take that, cut that breastbone, Rick, and put that spreader on there, and it's just laying there, man. I start going to, then all of a sudden they hook up these tubes. This is what happens. They hook up these tubes, and they go, and shock it to stop. And I'm thinking, oh. <laughs> I'm so intrigued by that that when my time came, unfortunately, due to uh, family history, I knew what they were going to do. And I knew my Savior had my back. And I was going to win either way. That muscle, we've got to have it. They repaired mine. I'm rocking and rolling. I am 
one mean mamma jamma. I'm doing whatever I get. I'm doing it. Here it is. But it's talking about setting our hearts, believers, on heavenly things. It's got to be so that we can live. But what is the, that vital organ that we have, this one that if it stops, we're doomed. The most important organ that we have is saying, set your heart on heavenly things. What do you spend your time thinking about? Money? Food? Clothes? Where are you and when are you spending time thinking about Jesus and holiness, compassion, and integrity? Set your mind on heavenly things. On heavenly things. Since you've been raised with Christ, because of what Christ has done for you, now you must set your heart, that most vital organ you have, on heavenly things. My brother, my sister, what are you passionate about? Wherever your passion is where your heart is going to be set. All Paul is saying is focus on Jesus Christ. Focus on him. He's seated at the right hand of God. And then by doing that, it reveals Jesus' power, his authority, and his position as both a judge and an advocate. Have you ever thought of him as that? A judge and an advocate? You need to because he'll be at that great white throne judgment. He will be the judge that says, I ain't know him. I don't know her. Or he'll be an advocate and say, Father, he's mine. Let him on in. You see, that's what Jesus is going to do. That's scripture. So we must set our hearts and focus on Christ. I know that you've got work to do. And I know that you've got to go to school. And I know moms and dads, you've got to raise kids. I know grandmothers and, and papas, you've got to do the same thing. I know that we've got 29,000 things that we've got to get done. Clean the house or not clean the house. Work on the car or not work on the car. We've got to do all this type of stuff. It's like we're juggling. But how often do we put another ball in that's Jesus and one that's God? And here's the Holy Spirit. And then maybe we need to Take out worrying about cleaning the house and take out worrying about working on the car and sooner or later, all we're juggling are the really important things. God you're never going to change good enough. Let God change you. If we're setting our, mind, our hearts on that and we're focusing on Christ, then he also says this, set your minds on things above. Now I want to tell you, that's two important organs that we're talking about. There are brains in our skull, and guess what? Some of them are huge and full of real smartness. And then there's me. You know, you know I'm, I'm proud to say that I'm one of five kids in my family that I grew up in. My oldest sister, 10 years older than me, she was valedictorian at Dunbar High School. Then there was my brother, and then I have another brother, brother right above me. He was valedictorian at Dunbar High School. Then there was me, and then I have a younger sister. She was valedictorian at Dunbar High School. <laughs> you know, something missed a beat there. But if our minds are focused on the right things, then guess what? We can become pretty doggone smart. Amen? Amen. Do you want to be smart for God? Do you want to have passion to learn? You've been challenged, and here it comes. How many of you all completed the homework assignment that I gave you last week from the pulpit? You be truthful. How many of you all read the book of Romans? Very well done for you all. For the rest of you, shame on you. That's all i got to say. Shame on you. For you that did not get it done, read the book of Romans. In addition to however you're reading the, the New Testament or the whole Bible this year, read the book of Romans. What he's saying here is if we set aside time, if we make it important, see, we're only going to make it important, we're only going to do something if we make it important. Folks, I stayed up last night till after midnight. 
My sole purpose, and I'm being sincere, my sole purpose, and you know this, was to root on the demise of the Steelers. It was. That's the only reason I stayed up. It was. I'm not trying to be funny. I stayed up. It was important to me. And I focused my mind at that point, come on, Cincinnati, and beat them. And, of course, they didn't. There's two teams never to root against because they're always going to win, the Steelers and the New York Yankees. They're always going to win. Here's the deal. I set aside time. It was important to me. I'm telling you to set aside time to read God's Word. Set your mind. Concentrate on the eternal rather than the temporal. Thoughts can influence actions, so please God with both. Don't focus on the earthly things, the legalistic rituals, and frankly, the false methods of achieving holiness. Our society is so messed up right now that you must, you must, Know the difference between right and wrong according to God's word. Because if you do not, you're going to say, well, that's okay. I'm okay with that. Yeah, that's fine. Well, then he, and God's word explicitly says no. Philippians 4a says this. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. Put your mind on such things. That's awesome. Would you agree with that? If we do that, then guess what? Us being raised with Christ is going to matter. We're going to be passionate about our relationship with Jesus. It's going to be there and help us endure when tough times hit. Because hard times are coming for all of us. All of us. And the last thing that I want to say really is talking about dead and alive. We died to our sins, and Jesus gives us the right to live for him right now because we're certain to live forever. You see, that's the difference between the people he's writing this letter to. They're going to live forever in heaven, and the ones that don't know Jesus are going to live forever in the lake of fire. We all live forever, and we get to choose where we're going to live. And I think that is so cool. We really do. Let's continue with our scripture, 5 through 10, Colossians. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is adultery. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. God, keep blessing us with these words, please. Thank you. Put to death, he says. Put to death. Two things that he says there, and there's a list of them. I want you to write them in. Okay? The first thing he says is the sexual sins. He lists them. Again, we're seeing sexual sins listed that we're not supposed to do. Sexual immorality. Folks, sexual immorality is this. It's uh, having sex outside of marriage. You're not supposed to live with someone. That's a sin. That's sexual immorality. Folks, that's intercourse and outer course. That's anything that you want to put down on there. That is the truth. And you might be saying, boy, that's pretty hard coming from the pulpit. Where better it come from than God's word? Impurity. Be pure. And you know what irritates me? When we think about being pure, we always think of women. Be pure, my lady. Young men, I'm talking to you. Be pure. Both of us, men and women, need to be pure. If you are married, dad, go on it, then stay there. Don't step out. Do the things that are right. Lust. Let's be honest. Even President Carter, when he was in office, and I, hey, I don't care if you liked him in office or not, what a great Christian man he was and is. He even talked about lusting in his mind as he sees a beautiful woman. This is a hard one. And we don't talk about it enough. Man, go to the beach nowadays? Come on. 
You know, guys, but women, jeez, that's hard. <laughs> we were in Cancun on a trip. My wife and I, I had won a trip years ago. We were in Cancun. I'm going off. I know I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going off. <laughs> And we were in one of those hotels that had four or five beautiful swimming pools. And my wife and I, we went down to one of the pools and it was just us. And it was awesome. It was very romantic. It was pretty cool. We were just, we were, it was just nice. Then all of a sudden, this, and I'm not knocking age, so please, okay? But here comes this 70, 75 year old woman. And she came down. She had one of those covers on. Everything's cool. And I'm at one end of the pool and she comes in, you know. I'm not paying attention to her. And so she takes off her cover. And she turns. And she's got a phone on. <laughs> huh? That's not lust.
been in other places that the pastor should have and didn't do that. So I applaud you. We've got a lot of work to do here. We've got a lot of work. You see, you're changed from the old self to the new self. And then there's that word that we had last week and it's on the front of your bullet. Renewed. Renewed. Transformed in knowledge. We've got to be better men and women of the Bible. We've got to be more in tune with God's Holy Spirit so that we know what's right and wrong. And we will act accordingly. We will use our voice to make the yes is yes and the no is no. Are you doing that? He continues on in 12 and 14. He says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on what? Love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. You see, Christ is all in all. See, you are chosen. And you might think, wait a minute. I'm not going to get into out here, but I'm going to tell you that God knows you. And God is well aware of everything. And in knowing everything, He knows who will accept Him and who won't. You're chosen. If you've accepted Christ, you're chosen. If you're ready to accept Christ, you're chosen. Be glad and rejoice in it. Understand it and hold on to it. And then it says, close yourself with a nature that pleases God. Write that in. A nature that pleases God. And then there was a list of them. This is great scripture this morning. This is something you need to take back and go over again. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness. All of these please God. Does that mean that we have a full measure of them all? I don't think so. I think some of you all are full of compassion. Some of you are full of gentleness. Some of you are full of, of uh, forgiveness. And you've got a little bit of everything else. What we need to do is try to build our building blocks on each one of them just a little bit bigger, a little bit higher. How? By having passion for Jesus Christ. The more passion we have, the more all about it that we're going to be. And we're going to love one another. John 13 says this, A new command I give you, Jesus speaking, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. It's all about worrying about Lisa. It's all about uh, being in prayer for Tiffany Lucas as she's carrying the baby. It, it's all in prayer about uh, Earl Meadings and his surgery that's going to be tomorrow. And Brittany Cantrell's surgery on Wednesday. And there was somebody else in there. It's all about knowing who has lost their job and needs help and reaching out. It's all about caring, 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 and then putting feet on your prayer life. I go back and tell you that his will, his way is all action. It always has been. It always will be. What's God telling you to do for somebody this week? Is it just going to be the same old week? And you're not going to do anything for anybody else? Or are you going to pick up the phone and check on somebody? Or are you going to send somebody a card? Dude, there's, there's card people in our congregation. And sometimes I've told you, I get a card in the mail. I'm not asking for me for cards. That's not it. But I got a card in the mail sometimes. And it's just like when I've got a down day. It's just like, oh, man. Thanks, Don. That's pretty cool. It's all about loving one another and caring. If there's one descriptive word of Genesis Fellowship from my side of the fence, it's family. Would you agree with that? Colossians continues and we end in our scripture by saying, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalm and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father to Him. I want you to grab God and let peace rule. I know some of you all are struggling. It's been a while since you've come to church and just relaxed. So much turmoil in your life and in churches and at your job. I want you to relax here, but I want you to relax at home through Christ. I want you to relax here, and I want you to relax at home, and I want you to relax at the job site through Christ. 
I want you to relax in your relationships. You see, peace is something that is given by living in love with one another. All of our virtues binding together will lead us to peace. This tranquility and cooperation between the family and God. Remember what Jesus said in another scripture. John 14 says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. You see, he said, I've got the peace. And I'm leaving it for you. Are you going to grab it? Or are you going to let it stay on the side? You see, let peace rule in your heart, your mind, and your soul. If you are focused if you are raised up with Christ, if you are setting your minds and your hearts on the heavenly things, then guess what? Your heart, mind, and soul, everything about you then is going to be turned to God. And then everything that you're going to be doing, His will, will become His way. And be thankful. <clears throat> When's the last time that you had a prayer of thanksgiving just to God? Not about your kids, not about your job, not about your spouse, not about your girlfriend or boyfriend. You just say, God, I just want to thank you because you're daggone too cool to even believe. You're awesome. Be thankful for everything and let his word become you. His word become you. Let God's scripture become you. Allow it to dwell in you. Meditate on it day and night. Learn it and be, let it be your guide. The more you read the word, the more you get involved in it. Folks, another thing I want to tell you that it's talking about teaching and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and songs and hymns. That's what we have up here and what we sing, that should pick you up. You're a good, good father. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. And I'm loved by you. That's who I am. That's who I am. Is that who you are? Do you feel God's love? Because everything that we've talked about, he ends it with this one statement. Basically, I'm prepared for whatever you do, do it in the name and for Jesus Christ. When you work, you work for Jesus. When you teach your kids, you teach your kids for Jesus. When you have to spank your kids, you spank them for Jesus. When you fix food, when you brush your teeth. Again, got a young lady that accepted Christ on Wednesday night. Youth group was awesome. 25 kids, six adults, they were rocking. And a young lady was very, very quiet, accepted Christ. And you know what I want to say, and you all know that I'm not on Facebook, but my wife is. Later that night, we're downstairs. She said, Mark, let me read you something. Taylor will phone and send a message the rest of the GF full throttle youth. See, and I'm going to paraphrase. It said, Hey, GF youth, I'm saved. <clears throat> That's doing something for God. Let others know. So I ask you, are you a passionate follower of Jesus Christ? Are you filled with intense emotional drive or excitement when you think of Him? Do you set your heart mind, mind on godly things and desire to make God smile. I hope so. But if you're not, we can change that this morning. Let's pray together. God, we love you and you are our Father. You are everything to us. And we thank you for just blessing us and allowing us to come and to worship you this morning. Father, we want to be passionate followers of you, always doing your will, your way. Help us, help us, help us to see it and fulfill that mission. In the name of Jesus, we pray all God's children said. Amen. Pastor Anthony, come on up front with me. We stand unified in front of the body of believers today, and those that are here are seekers, because we're going to give you an opportunity. You see, God's word says that it never goes out and returns void. It means empty. You have heard God's word, and at Genesis Fellowship, we're going to give you an opportunity to act upon it. Folks, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, I don't care who you sit beside of, I don't care who you came with. This is a personal one-on-one -on -one thing. Is it your
your day? Is it time for you to say, I want Christ? I want to become a passionate follower. I want my mind, heart, and soul always to be thinking about Him. And guess what? During this song, you come forward and you be up here with us, one of us to pray with you. We will not embarrass you. It's not a funny moment. It's serious. Number two, if you are a follower of Christ and you're not passionate and you want to be more passionate about Him, the altar's open. Come and kneel down. Come and stand. Come and pray with us. Make your commitment to Him today. This isn't a rededication. This is, I'm grabbing you, God, and I'm not ever going to let go. But that's what we're supposed to do. Number three, if it's time for you to join this church, you've been here for a while, you know what we're about, then come on, jump in, the dag on seat of the next train that's leaving Dodge, baby, because we're moving. And you need to be on board. And the last thing is this. Guess what? Baptism. Baptism is real. It's true. It doesn't have anything to do with your salvation. It has everything to do with following Christ and what the Word says. If you've never been fully immersed in baptism, we've got real soon. We've got four that are going to be baptized real soon. Jump in. Let's do it right. Are you a passionate follower? It's laid out in front of us. Let's stand and grab a hold of what God is saying this morning.